Welcome to another edition of Methodist Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Ryan Danker. And today is the 4th of March, 2019. Now, if you see Ryan breaking out and smiles and stuff like that, it's because I just ruined the first introduction, and this is a retaping. Um, we met oh, probably three or four times, mostly at uh, some Anglican events down in the Charleston area, and yes. uh, you went to Duke, you're a professor, and I thought you could give a little introduction because we're going to talk United Methodist. And as far as I know and, and think, you, you're probably one of the top go-getters in the United Methodism, as far as I'm concerned. And so oh. it would be kind of good to talk about that. You're like, no, 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 no. Yes, no. yes, yes, yes. No. <laughs> so <laughs> so let's, uh, let's get, why don't you introduce, what do you do? Well, I'm, I'm on the faculty at Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C., and I've been there for four years. And um, my area is Wesley Studies and Church History. And so I have the the pleasure to teach uh, wonderful students here in the nation's capital. All right. Wesley, that's Methodist. Very Methodist. Now, did you happen to be in St. Louis last week? I was not in St. Louis last week. You just got, you got to watch it, though. I watched it. I watched most of it, yes. Yeah, I'm calling it the Rumble in St. Louis. Well, um, the cage match. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about the buildup. Uh, as far as the United States press and a lot of the European press, uh, this was a foregone conclusion. Mm -hmm. The people within the United States branch of the United Methodist Church had the votes to once and for all overturn these horrible old doctrinal rules on uh, homosexuality and same-sex weddings and um, that type of relationship within the church context. And mm -hmm. they're going to change the doctrine. And I saw a lot of that with a lot of my United Methodist friends, too. Even the conservatives are like, I don't see this going any other way. We're going to fall like the Lutherans, like the Episcopal Church, like the um, Presbyterians. I mean, Irby, you just see them all falling. And it, now it's the United Methodist Church's turn to fall. And I'm looking at last Thursday and Friday, and my jaw hit the floor. Really? Like, you guys didn't fall. So either I fell for what the press told me, my friends were not in the know, or I didn't talk to you first. You, you didn't talk to me, Kevin. <laughs> um, right. I mean, since 1972, the United Methodist Church has had uh, in its book of discipline, so it's canons, if I can, I'll translate this into Anglican. Please theory. do. <laughs> um, our canons have stated that, that um, homosexual activity, so, so the focus is behavior. That's, that's key, by the way is incompatible with Christian teaching. And ever since the, we passed that, there have been fights at our general conference, you can call it general convention if you want to, mm -hmm. um, about whether or not we should hold to that statement or not. Now, we've strengthened that statement in other ways. We've said that, that self-avowed practicing homosexuals cannot serve as, as clergy within the United Methodist Church, nor can our clergy um, uh, participate in uh, same-sex weddings or blessings. Those are the three areas where we've been fighting. But you're right, there was this sense on a, and that came out of the, uh, the Commission on the Way Forward and the Council of Bishops uh, that this one church plan, as it was called, was, was going to be passed. Some people thought it was inevitable. Um, there was definitely a, an inevitability campaign um, but it but it failed, and uh, it failed, in fact, because of um, a, co a coalition of evangelicals across the globe. That's kind of the difference here, isn't it? You are a global church, and you're representative by the size of your synods, or I'm trying oh, to, to right. think of the right, uh, what's, what's method ease here? Well, it's an annual conference, but it, you, in, in the Anglican ease, it would be a diocese. A diocese. So if you have a large diocese, you have more votes. If you have a small right. diocese, you have less votes. Um, it's representative, if anything. And so yeah. that seems to be the, the magic pill to losing this here in America. Absolutely, because the, well, for instance, my home conference is the Western North Carolina Conference. And uh, we have around 300,000 members. So 
uh, our delegation is larger than all the conferences um, west of Texas because there are more Methodists in western North Carolina than there are in what we call our western jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. But likewise, um, there are, are five and a half million uh, United Methodists outside the U.S. with a large percentage of those in Africa. And they're growing by leaps and bounds. It's amazing the revival that's taking place in Africa. And I know that you're, you know, the Anglican years, you, you know the same thing with Anglican churches in Africa. Our Methodist churches, United Methodist churches are growing. And so their representation at General Conference is growing as well. And they're pretty much uniformly evangelical in outlook. So you've seen this yourself in America, the liberalization of the United Methodist Church. Um, I'm sure yesterday a lot of people went to church and they heard anger if they went to an American United, United Methodist Church. It's possible. I mean, it's the possible. American, yeah, I want to be careful. The American church is not monolithic. Mm -hmm. um, some people, and I'm not saying this at you, Kevin, um, some people want to say that the Americans are united on this, and we're not. Um, there is still a very strong percentage um, of, of United Methodists in the States who uh, would have a traditionalist approach to human sexuality. In fact, there was, a, um, a, there was research done in the last um, couple of months about the theological makeup of American United Methodism, and it found that 44% of American United Methodists identify as conservative or traditionalist theologically. Wow. Um, 20, what was it, 28 percent, 26 percent as centrists, and then 20 or 18 or 20 as liberal. And it even found that um, when you got into the nitty gritty of the, um, the data, it found that our centrists lean to the right. And so American Methodism is definitely not uniform in this regard and contains um, quite a number of perspectives and, and quite a few evangelicals. As a uh, theologian of uh, Wesley, I think you would probably find it ironic if you guys were the last man standing after all this. Uh, Anglicanism is going to uh, certainly take a, a fall and a split. Um, the Roman Catholic Church, mm. what, I don't know what's going on over there. I don't know either, you and know, I, I'm the, on the Methodist Catholic dialogue. Yeah, so, the Lutherans, yeah. Southern Baptists are yeah you know, probably a couple meetings away. Protestants, um, you're all yeah. You, know, you guys may be the, all that's left in in a generation. Mm. Well, let's hope not. I you know I. Yeah, it's it's hard to know. I, it's hard to know exactly what'll happen. Um, what I'm not surprised by is the strong evangelical coalition that's formed in the United Methodist Church. Um, because it's interesting, the, the United Methodist Church was more liberal than it is today mm -hmm. in 1960. Uh, and in 68, when we merged with the EUB and formed the United Methodist Church, um, we were a more theologically liberal church then than we are now. Uh, studies have shown that, that a high percentage of our clergy at that point did not believe in the virgin birth. And yet, even today, self-identified liberals in our denomination, the majority of them, believe in the virgin birth. So there's been, there are interesting theological movements within Methodism, and I think the resurgence of an evangelical heritage is a part of that across the board, regardless of whether or not somebody thinks they're conservative or liberal. In the Episcopal Church, when they didn't, the liberals didn't get their way, they found themselves uh, sneaking in and overtaking the universities, the seminaries. Mm. Um, I suspect that this is going to be repeated, uh, if not already tried. I don't know I'm about the uh, United Methodists, but uh, what is the regard to re-education through the seminaries? Well, you know, our seminaries um, are not as connected to the church as the Episcopalian ones were. Mm. Um, and so they each stand in their own tradition and their own way of doing things. Um, they're connected to the, to the UMC and they receive funding uh, from the UMC, a portion of their funding is not complete. Um, and so that's a, that's a difficult question to answer. Mm -hmm. um, there are leading evangelical seminaries in the Methodist world and there are leading progressive seminaries in the Methodist world. 
um, I happen to teach at one that's that's a leading centrist seminary, um, and and so it, it's a bit more complex, I think, than than that. Okay, complex. Yeah. How do you? All right. Okay. Obvious, well, no, I know. It, it, you want to keep your job. I want to keep oh, my job. Of course. <laughs> of course. I'm just telling you the, the reality of it. It's not. It's not even a matter of me keeping my job. It's simply a matter of. Um, uh, you know, in the Episcopal system, bishops tell the the uh, candidates for ministry where to go, and we don't have that kind of that. This ours are not. We're not connected like that. That's good. I mean, that's that's actually a benefit. I I know as is it Asbury, Asbury, yeah, uh, is a huge seminary that it's not Methodist complete, but you guys produce a lot of uh, Methodists through there. Oh yeah, well that yeah and. and that's why we often talk about the 13 plus one. There are 13 official seminaries, and then there's Asbury, That's which right. is the plus one. And it's, in fact, um, you take our three largest seminaries, official seminaries, and you're still not as big as Asbury. No, it's it's a, an amazing place that they, they produce. You know, that's what it is. All right, let's talk a little bit about the future. Um, it's not over, is it? Oh, the debates? Yeah. No, no, definitely not over. And in fact, you know, we have caucus groups, essentially, we call them renewal groups. Mm -hmm. um, in uh, in United Methodism, there's Good News, there's the Wesleyan Covenant Association, there's some other groups on the right. On the left, you have uh, Love Prevails or the Reconciling Ministry Network. Um, and they've all said, we're staying in and we're going to fight on. Um, nobody has so far said, we're, we're jumping ship. And I think that that means that we're going to fight about this next year at a, a regularly scheduled general conference. And that's in St. Paul. That's going to happen the same place where the Episcopal Church decided Gene Robinson was a good idea. Oh, I, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Irony. I do want to thank you for your time. Um, this is going to be interesting to see how it plays out, and I'd like to invite you back to the program uh, as future, not future, future details emerge. And yeah. uh, uh, mm -hmm. I think you offer a great perspective because uh, you're in the academia, and uh, although you deny it, you're a go-getter within the United yeah. Methodist Church. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. It's good to be with you. You too. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm Ryan Danker. And you've been watching Unofficially Methodist Unscripted. Unofficially Methodist Unscripted.